Hi, all. Uh, my name is Brendan Considine. I'm uh, a graduate student from Montreal. And I'm here to talk today a little bit about the research that we've been doing and uh, some interesting things I learned along the way. Um, if you have any questions, the organizers asked me to make sure you raise your hand and so you can get a mic. Um, so there's uh, five things I really uh, like to try to talk to you about today. Um, what are derivatives? Uh, maybe this will be kind of a little bit of recap for you if you went to Eric's talk. Um, how does differentiation work? Uh, how can we implement it on a computer? Um, what can we derive uh, when we have this? So what things are, are possible to get? And um, what are the conditions for uh, differentiability? And how can I do this in Kotlin, of course, because we're here at Kotlin Conf. And um, what's the, well, why should you care? Well, what's the big difference? Um, this seems like maybe kind of abstract, but uh, it seems like there's a lot of people here, so that's kind of interested. That's exciting. Um, yeah, so what are derivatives? Uh, this is kind of a long and storied history. We kind of have a short period here, but um, this goes back kind of hundreds of years, as uh, we heard. It has um, quite a bit of uh, invention and reinvention. So we'll just kind of touch on uh, three figures along this way. So you kind of um, look back, kind of the end of the 1600s, uh, the end of the Renaissance, start of the Enlightenment, uh, starting to look at, you know, how can we formalize some of these models that uh, describe physics and the world around us. And um, kind of an interesting character uh, was uh, Leibniz. He um, had some very contemporary views about uh, minds and machines. And I think if he went in a time machine, it went back and wouldn't be or brought him here, they wouldn't be completely out of place. Uh, he's uh, got some interesting things to say about um, com com computation and uh, uh, cognition and lots of things. So uh, you can kind of look him up on Wikipedia if you care. Uh, um, so it's kind of fitting that we're here in Copenhagen because uh, this is one of the places in this uh, history that um, is kind of kind of interesting. So more recently, um, in you know, the uh, Northeast European Computing Center, uh, there was a bunch of uh, computer scientists, and uh, one of them was uh, Seppo Lindema. He was a, a Finn, and he came down here for his master's degree. He was studying how to um, analyze local errors and how they propagate through a long program, and. Uh, so as the story goes, he's sitting in a park here and uh, came up with this algorithm, which is today known as reverse mode automatic differentiation. And, um, and so this is right here, it's kind of kind of cool. And he's um, a professor at, in Helsinki. Um, a lot of these ideas were kind of studied and popularized uh, in the 70s and 80s. People were looking at uh, larger scientific um, simulations, uh, and so this, this idea has broad applicability, um, and maybe you hear a lot about it now um, in machine learning and optimization literature, but uh, this has a, a lot of applications, and so uh, if you're interested in learning more about those, I uh, highly encourage you to check out this book from your local library or order it on Amazon. Uh, it's got a good history and, and a lot of techniques that uh, would be useful. Um, for what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so let's um, see. I, I would like to motivate this with a few examples. Um, so to kind of take a step back, um, we saw a little bit about um, optimization. And so uh, let's think about an algorithm for minimizing a function. Um, this can be any function that you so please. Uh, as long as the outputs are comparable, uh, we have some way to uh, say if it's one is better than the other, then uh, this algorithm will eventually uh, get the minimum. So we pass it a budget and an initial um, kind of guess. And let's say uh, we give it, you know, uh, 100,000 time steps. And depending on the, num the size of the input space, 
um, this will eventually converge to uh, the, the global minimum if we give it enough time. Now, maybe we don't have that amount of time, but here we have you know, our, our base case and the recursive case here, where you know, if, if we're, we pass an input to the function, we get something that's less than the current minimum, then we pass that forward and uh, we record that as our minimum and we decrement the budget, right? So all you have to do is implement this kind of random sample. And if you do this well, then this might be a perfectly good algorithm. You might like uh, how it works. Um, so we'll leave that uh, exercise to the reader. But uh, it has some nice properties in that we don't uh, care about what type of input it is or what type of output it is as long as we can compare them. Good. Okay, so here's another algorithm that's a little bit more restrictive, but um, it gives us a little bit better efficiency, and uh, it has some nice properties. So we need to define something called a metric, and there's some technical conditions for things that satisfy this, but uh, let's just say, for now, we have these two operators, uh, addition and subtraction, kind of correspond to the familiar uh, arithmetic. Um, so what we'd like to do is, uh, take uh, a, a difference uh, between two outputs, right? So we'd like to find which output is um, better than another when we perturb an input. So here we have the same kind of setup. We pass it a, a function, uh, give it initial guess and some budget. And we'd like to um, uh, wiggle this, this input a little bit. Uh, so kind of perturb it, and, and maybe there's just a few of these, um, a few ways we could do this. Or maybe there's a, a great many, and so, um, but as long as we were able to do that, and we can uh, compute this distance from our, in our output space, then uh, we'll be able to find which perturbation gives us the, the biggest bang for our buck, right? So um, this is, uh, an algorithm called hill climbing, which allows us to kind of do this. And it's, uh, it's perfectly suitable for a lot of applications. Um, so we should kind of think of this as uh, things that get more efficient as we make more assumptions about the inputs and the outputs. Any questions? Good. Okay, so here's an even better algorithm um, that uh, makes some additional assumptions about the input and the output. Um, if we can assume that we have um, real numbers or uh, best approximation to that, then um, we can do a lot more. So we need to do um, two additional things. We need to have multiplication and division. And these give us uh, a lot of power for doing uh, this type of optimization. So we can compute this um, here, which they roughly tells us uh, what is the ratio of uh, a change in the output to a change in the input, right? And then when we do that, then we can just kind of iteratively update our minima until we get to um, something that converges. And here we don't need to do um, a whole bunch of perturbations, right? This is kind of nice. It, it, we only have to do um, well, two, if we do this naively, we have to evaluate the function twice. And, and we decrement our budget, and we have uh, all this other machinery, right? So maybe this is kind of still a little bit abstract, but um, this should look familiar if you uh, recall your kind of uh, early algebra calculus class. Um, you have uh, this, this thing called a finite difference, right? And uh, as you make this, a smaller, then you get a better approximation of uh, this this ratio, and, and so uh, this is kind of you know a nice uh, a nice way to, to to narrow down our scope and get a little bit more efficiency. But what's the problem with this? Well, first of all, if we use the naive implementation here. There's two uh, two evaluations of of, the, of our function, right? And so um, this is fine, this is all well and good if you have one input and one output. Um, maybe you, know, you can uh, 
suffer this cost. But if you have more inputs, then you're going to have to compute this for every input. Um, every, every input. Yeah. And so this grows uh, linearly with respect to the number of inputs you have. Huh. OK, well, mm, maybe that's still fine. But let's say you have um, a number of outputs, so not just a single scalar value, but uh, multiple outputs. And so here we have to compute the uh, sensitivity of a change to every input and a change to every output, right? So, th so this is a little bit worse. And, and so here, you know, this is something where we really like to have a better algorithm. And, um, and so, yeah, th this is kind of the motivation for why do we want to do differentiation in the context of optimization. Well, um, what if we to we, 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 I told you that there was a, a, a nice algorithm that did this in constant time with a constant amount of overhead? Uh, so, spoiler alert, there is such an algorithm. And uh, let's see how it works. So, yeah, this is a little bit of a recap, but I think it's important to kind of uh, really understand how um, this works at a, at a kind of atomic level, right? So, um, here, you know, kind of visualizing uh, what we're computing again is this, um, this ratio, right? People have been doing this for centuries, but. Uh, yeah, this is um, maybe something a little bit new. So this is really maybe Leibniz's you know, kind of flash of genius. Yeah. So here, we can do this symbolically. We don't even have to do this uh, division multiplication. See this, this um, uh, notational innovation, I don't know what you want to call it. This um, is meant to be evocative of division, but really there's no division that's happening here. This is just kind of a notational thing. So you can think of this as an operator. And when you apply this operator to this function, you can, can think of this as applying this linearly to each of the components. Um, so we can take the derivative of the left and the right separately and then add them together. Right? And we can do this. This is um, kind of very amenable to a functional approach. So similarly, for multiplication, if you have a, a product of two functions, then you can take the derivative of the left times the right, and the derivative of the right times the left, and add them together. And multi so you multiply this by the original values, and then add them together. Right? Um, so this is, this is the product rule. And then we just need one more, uh, this chain rule. Right? So kind of, uh, if you have a function composed of another function, this is a derivative of the left times or with respect to the right times the derivative of the right with respect to your, your input. Um, good, yeah. So, so this is, you know, allows us to recover a lot of mathematics. All you need is addition, multiplication, and their inverses. Um, and so we can kind of um, just apply these rules naively uh, to get a symbolic representation of the derivative. But um, maybe we'd like to do this in a little more principled way. So we have this, uh, this nice chain rule, which gives us um, an expansion for, for each of these function compositions. And what we can do is whenever we receive a comp composition, then uh, we do this expansion. Um, so let's say you have a recursive function, and it's defined like this. There's a lot of math here, let's see. Uh, so what we, we want to do is you can take the derivative of each one respect in the chain with respect to the next one until we get to the end of the chain. And so this is a, just a, a product. We just multiply this out. Um, and for scalars, you know, this is pretty straightforward to do. But um, where this, the order of multiplication becomes really important. So as we remember, multiplication is associative, so we can add um, you know, match parentheses wherever we please. But, um, and, and this also generalizes to um, vector functions, functions that take multiple inputs and emit multiple outputs. Um, but where this becomes important is the order of the, different, the, order of the multiplication um, really matters when, when you, you have uh, matrices. Uh, so let's uh, think about this um, from a matrix perspective. So here you're doing the same thing. You're multiplying these matrices. And if you remember a little bit about uh, matrix math, you have 
the, um, these inner uh, dimensions have to match, right? And so uh, there's these two modes, right, that they use. And if you have a large number of inputs and a small number of outputs, then really you want to use this reverse mode. And this is typically the case in uh, a lot of uh, these modern function approximators. And then um, in the reverse, if you have a small number of inputs or a large number of outputs, and a small number of inputs and small number of outputs, you want to use this forward mode accumulation. Um, and so there's uh, some nice details about this in my colleague Olivier Brillo's talk uh, last year, but this is kind of the gist of what they're trying to do. So you have um, these vector functions, the composition of vector functions, and um, you, you, can, you can implement this using symbolic differentiation or dual mode um, differentiation. So there's, there's lots of ways to do this, but uh, this really uh, goes to the heart of what um, these modern automatic differentiation frameworks are trying to do. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, and this is, this reverse mode is what Seppo uh, Linima came up with. And so this has kind of spurred a lot of um, interesting innovation in machine learning and uh, for the for m many different subjects, but um, so so th this this idea I think is is a good way to capture um, what's happening inside of say a neural network, where it has a lot of times you see this um, graph of uh, connected nodes and things, but the, really it's just a, a series of function compositions, and um, and we can use the chain rule, They're just straight out of the box. Okay, so how do we implement this in Kotlin? Um, so Let's see. Uh, so just for scalar functions, let's consider this um, as our uh, kind of boilerplate. We have, um, you know, the sum, product, and composition rules, right? And uh, we have this, um, this data structure. We can call it a D or whatever you like. And this uh, takes a function and applies um, the derivative depending on what, what the type of each of the uh, what the function is. And so if it's a sum, you know, we have these uh, left and right, and similarly the product. What, what are we missing here? Are we missing any, um, anything in particular? Well, you know, if would we have a constant, or if we have um, a derivative itself? So here, um, do the same thing. So this is a kind of, sort of like a pattern match, but it's, um, if you're familiar with that, but it has, um, we just match on the, the type of the function itself. And so for this, cr crucially, you need to have um, a graph. And so that, that's uh, the main difference between what we're doing here and this um, uh, dual mode accumulation, where you kind of uh, have uh, evaluate this at every step. So here we're just building a graph, right? Um, and each time we apply this, these operators, these are overloaded. So this will create a new sum, for example, and this will create a you know, sum of two products. Uh, this, is a, this is a lot of code, but um, what uh, I'd like to point out here is, is that we have um, this kind of DSL for building these um, data structures. We have the sum, the product, and uh, for simplicity we can say a division is the inverse of uh, multiplication. So, kind of want to reduce the number of uh, operators we have to implement. Um, and here, we, we try to be as lazy as possible. So uh, if you look at these bindings, what we're trying to do is um, return a value if all of the variables have been bound to um, a constant, or otherwise um, return another function. So it's kind of a, a way to uh, reassign variables for change of variables, or do uh, other types of um, bindings. Maybe you want to have a, a partial application or something. Um, okay, yeah. So when, when we invoke this function with some values, we're going to return either another function or uh, a value itself. So um, there's there's some type checking that we have to do in order to do this. And so uh, just for uh, simplicity, there's a few of these um, 
definitions here. Uh, it's kind of a little bit dense, but here, um, let's see, for multiplication, um, we see this, uh, th this property of matrices, right? If you have um, a matrix, you want the inner dimensions to match. Um, so it would be nice if we could uh, infer uh, an input type for um, when, when, when you take two functions and join them together. However, it seems kind of difficult to do this in the Kotlin type system. However, we can infer an output type very easily. Uh, this is uh, fairly straightforward. So each of these um, operators defines uh, a, a functional or higher order function that takes two functions as an input and returns a function as an output uh, with the correct output shape inferred, right? Um, and you can define this for lots of different operators. Uh, and, and we try to do this as lazily as possible. And so we only um, do an evaluation when uh, we receive uh, numerical values. And, um, and for everything else, we just construct a new node in this graph. And this graph is called a, a data flow graph. So uh, this is a pretty standard thing. If you're building a DSL, you have um, some data structure. And here we just store the entire graph because memory is cheap, why not? Um, there are some advantages to uh, folding or collapsing this graph, but um, really it, it's not so, so bad of a cost if we have uh, a very large graph. Um, so, yeah, so the, the benefits of this are that uh, later on uh, we can refactor this graph uh, using algebraic rules um, to, to get something that's, that's simpler or more appropriate for a downstream task. So that, that's kind of nice, but you don't have to do it. Um, but the, nice, the really nice thing is that it allows us to do higher order differentiation. So if you want to take the derivative of a derivative, then it's no problem. You just have the graph. It's, it's all there. And whereas if you collapse this, then you lose that information. Um, and so if you, if you only store the values, numerical values, and you have to do extra work to kind of get higher orders of this to work. Huh. OK. So, so maybe uh, let's think about what, what we can apply differentiation for. Um, what can we get when we apply it? And then uh, what are the functions that are um, uh, correct? Could we apply this to any function? Or are there just um, certain types that uh, we can, you know, maybe just real numbers works for those. So maybe, um, maybe there's some of that. Um, restrictions to that. That's what we can do. Uh, this is kind of a nice quote. Um, I like, it. so again, we're kind of walking in the footsteps of giants. We have um, a ton of scientific literature that goes back into the early 50s and 60s about using um, automatic differentiation for um, uh, astrophysics, computing orbital dynamics, um, lots of things. We got how we got to the moon. So, um, yeah, this is kind of, kind of, people have been thinking about this for a long time. So there's some con conditions for the types of functions you can apply this to uh, in, if you want to do this in a mathematical way. So uh, we have this, this definition of um, continuity, where if you make a small change to the input, um, bounded by delta, then the output should not change more than epsilon. Uh, and so this is kind of a nice way to characterize. So this has to be true for all points that you're differentiating uh, at. And uh, if this is true, then you have um, a continuous function. There's various definitions of this continuity. But um, this is kind of maybe one necessary but not sufficient condition for for a differentiable function, right? This, this certainly helps um, if we have something like this. Where kind of com in computers, we have uh, this, this, our world is really not like that, right? We have uh, these functions that respond sharply if you make a small change to the input. And it's a kind of discontinuous functions. You have a lot of step functions and things. And so um, when we, when we look at the world and we kind of represent it, um, we have to make these kind of discretizations. Or, uh, and, and so if you ask a computer scientist, you know, what's differentiable? Well, maybe nothing, you know, it's all, it's all uh, just binary, right? 
Um, but it turns out that for a lar large class of functions, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you can do this for integers, um, for binaries. So maybe there's something, something there that um, you know, the, the mathematicians were just too rigid in their definition. If you ask a physicist, you know, what's differentiable? Um, well, maybe everything. You know, they, they, it, we have you know, these discrete objects in the world, but if you look closely, these uh, have boundaries that are kind of fuzzy. Uh, and so um, we can describe the world in terms of these field equations. Or, you know, there, if, if two things collide, there's not an instantaneous change of velocity. Really, there's just kind of some, some squishiness there. So, um, so they have lots of nice differential equations for describing how this works. Um, in the top, we have a, a differential equation that relates uh, kind of potential to kinetic energy. And you know, we have um, for, for waves and uh, the heat and lots of um, uh, fields we can describe with these differential equations. So importantly, um, there are classes of functions where uh, you have to uh, evolve the system, right? So a lot of, for a lot of dynamics, um, you can uh, just take an input, uh, an initial state, and um, a time, uh, say 100 time steps later, uh, plug those in and get a closed form solution for what the state of the system will be 100 time steps later. But for a, a much larger class of functions, which we see in the real world, they, they have these nonlinear dynamics where you really have to compute the derivative of each particle with respect to every other particle at each time step because there's no exact analytical solution for this. So this is um, a big application of, of AD and in, uh, in physics. Um, we have these kind of these systems that are hard to solve without derivatives. And so that's, um, that's a nice uh, way we can think about applying this. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so how do we kind of um, take these two, two perspectives on uh, the world? You know, we have these discrete approximations and these continuous ones and uh, create something meaningful. Well, maybe this is a little bit of a cop-out, but we let the user decide. So um, if, if they uh, want to apply this to a discrete function, it will work as long as they define these operators of addition, multiplication, division, and so on. And maybe this is a valid thing to do. Uh, it's, a, it's a user choice. So um, what does this look like from a, an end user pr perspective? Well, you have um, yeah, some, some functions, and we, we use Le Leibniz's notation, but this is kind of uh, a, a choice. You don't have to do that. Um, and you, know, you can take arbitrarily high orders derivatives, uh, and you can you know, plot this. Uh, make it look pretty, but it's not super important uh, to have a visualization, but we do this symbolically, and so um, if you have uh, an input and an output, then you can kind of plot this in two-dimensional space, and it looks very nice. Um, yeah, so, uh, or 3D. Um, so the so nice thing about uh, type-safe languages, in as opposed to uh, those just do everything at runtime. Um, we have a compiler, and so we can check whether certain um, operators are valid on the uh, on the operands that it receives. So, um, for vectors, you know, if you're doing a, a product, you want the length to match. Uh, and so, if we have uh, literals uh, or some some form of an annotation, um, we can infer what these uh, should be, and if they don't, if the size is, is a mismatch, then it just won't compile. You'll get this error immediately, which is, is kind of nice. I, 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 um, I enjoy using these statically typed languages, and this is a, a nice way to kind of leverage those features. Um, so uh, we can do this for matrices as well. So if you have a, a ma two matrices, you try to multiply them together, and the inner dimensions don't match, then you just give them uh, a nice um, a little compiler error. And uh, the ID can localize this, and it's, it, the usability is, is really nice if you try, to, try it out. Um, similarly, we can do this for uh, currying if you have a, a limited number of variables. Um, so the idea here 
is that uh, if you know the number of inputs in your function and you apply values to each of those inputs, then you should receive a value back rather than a function. And so if you keep track of these, then with a little bit of type level magic, you can um, receive uh, annotation or feedback from the inf inference from the compiler that says uh, if you apply a variable that's not in the function to a value, then it doesn't, doesn't compute, doesn't make sense. Um, similarly, you know, if, you, uh, if you apply all the variables then to values, then you have uh, a value back. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of kind of interesting, um, but it's still very experimental. So it, it's it's hard to make this fit into the Kotlin type system, but it works. Uh, so um, I'd like to convey just a, a little bit of why you should care about this stuff. Uh, it seems like there's uh, the world of kind of software engineering is is very far from these uh, these functions that we used to describe, physics and so on. But the, the, the hope is that in, in the not too distant future, that computers will be uh, kind of an, an interface um, between the real world and us. And, or or the, the code itself is a, a way of injecting some of our knowledge about how the world works. And um, maybe we don't know all the parameters. We don't know how to get everything right. But we have a lot of very good models about the world. And so I don't think we're going to replace uh, software engineers. But I think that we can um, make their lives easier by uh, letting them define these global structures about you know, the dynamics of these systems and how the world evolves over time, and then uh, maybe fine tune the parameters. And so in order to do this, um, we developed a, like a little DSL that um, just a simple prototype for how you can uh, play around with this. And it, it's kind of just um, a way to uh, demonstrate some nice ideas that others have developed uh, long before. But there's a bunch of applications for robotics and um, computer vision and so on. So I think you're starting to see more of those in, in your devices and things uh, on a daily basis. Um, yeah, so, so this is uh, also motivated by this idea of differentiable programming, where if you have um, a computer implements, you know, just a few simple operations, and uh, if we have a way to propagate errors through this this program, then we can change parameters and uh, update the program itself um, to uh, to make it a little bit more suitable for the actual data you receive. So, um, so there's a lot of interesting research at the intersection of of these two fields, um, kind of making computing a little bit more uh, flexible and uh, differentiable. Um, so uh, if you'd like to learn more about that, um, there's uh, details here at um, this URL. And uh, if you're interested in mathematical programming um, abstractions for uh, other types of uh, number systems, you might be interested in this a project that does something along the same lines, uh, uses algebraic um, constructs to represent uh, math, and then you can evaluate it later um, using whatever number system you like. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to my advisors, Liam Paul, Michael Samilis, and Jin Guo, um, and uh, uh, Ducky Town, which is a project I worked on. Um, for during my master's degree, it's applying some of these ideas um, more recently. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about um, the applications of uh, mathematical uh, computing in um, software engineering. And um, if you'd like to chat, I'm, I'll be here um, till the weekend. And uh, you should definitely check out their work as well. Um, I've been asked to uh, encourage you to vote because it helps me, it helps the organizers, and uh, it, uh, it's a great way to uh, improve in future iterations. So uh, I'll be happy to take questions at this time. Thanks. <laughs>